I have selected a single uh, insight from the Bhagavad Gita which I want to share with you. Something that will be very useful for you. You know in the Gita there is something very interesting. I have often wondered why Krishna did not tell the Gita to Duryodhana. If he had told the Gita to Duryodhana and convinced him not to do all those things, you know evil things, maybe he could have avoided the Mahabharata war. And uh, as a matter of fact, Lord Krishna actually did try to uh, convince Duryodhana. Many of you will be aware of that episode, once he went to, to persuade Duryodhana. And you know what Duryodhana said, when Lord Krishna tried to tell him that you should not do all these things and it's uh, adharma, it's unrighteous, it's morally wrong, the way you are treating the Pandavas. Duryodhana's reply was very interesting. So Duryodhana's reply was very interesting. He said, don't tell me about dharma and adharma, what is right and wrong, don't tell me about that. Because that is not my problem. I know what is right and what is wrong, but my problem is different. He said, I know what is right, but my problem is, I don't want, feel like doing it. I know what is wrong, but my problem is, I can't stop myself from doing it. Janami dharmam nachame pravritti. Janami adharmam nachave nivritti. It's a very interesting insight into human nature. He says, Janami dharmam, I know what is right. What I should do, I know it. You need not tell me. Nachame pravritti, I have no interest in doing it. I don't feel like doing it. Janami adharmam, I know what is wrong, what is bad, what is evil. Nachame nivritti, I can't stop myself from doing it. Why not? Why not? Then he says, Kenapi devena hridistitena yatha niyojito asmi tatha karomi. There is some power inside me. As it is forcing me along, I do that. Whatever it makes me do, I do it. I am helpless. There is a strong tendency in me which makes me do certain things which I know it's wrong. And what I want to do, I know what it's, it's, it's right, I should follow this path, but I can't. I try and I fail. This is my problem. My problem is not right and wrong. I know what is right and wrong. You know, sometimes young people say, Gyan um, yeah. yaar, I know what is right and wrong. <laughs> so it's basically that was Duryodhana's reply. That was Duryodhana's reply. Arjuna has the same question in Bhagavad Gita. Very interesting. In the third chapter, fourth chapter, Arjuna asks Krishna, Forced by what does a person do wrong things? Anichanapi, even if he or she does not want to do it. He wants to lead his life in this way, but he slips, makes mistakes. Later on he regrets that. Anichan, he does not want to go on that path. But Baladiva Niyojita, he is forced somehow. Somehow it comes to, does these wrong things. And you know, it automatically echoes with us. We have these experiences on a larger scale or smaller scale, but we all have these experiences that uh, we want to do certain things, lead our life in a certain way. You are all students. Who has not got this experience? You make a very ambitious routine, you know. 12 hours a day, I will put in 12 hours studying. And then somehow the whole day is gone, you find, okay, I will do that tomorrow. Today I didn't do it. And we, as students, we have all experienced this. You want to lead your life in a particular way, you can't. You don't. Why not? Arjuna asks this. And the difference between Duryodhana and Arjuna lies in this precisely. Duryodhana did not ask a question. He put it as a matter of fact. I can't help it. This is my life. This is the way I am. I can't help it. What Arjuna does is, he puts it as a question. He says, what can I do about it? This is what's happening to me. How can I pull myself out of it? So if we are in Arjuna's position, we would like to know how to put our lives right. How can I, you know, I set a target, how can I achieve that? This is the question, what is Krishna's answer? So this is from Bhagavad Gita, but we'll take a detour, a sort of bypass. Instead of going straight to Krishna's answer, now I'll take you to the 1960s, a very well-known psychologist, Walter Michel, he had this experiment with little children. 
on this very subject. The experiment was like this. He took little four year old children, boys and girls, and the, what he said was to the children that um, here is a marshmallow, a kind of mithai, yeah, an American sweet. You want a marshmallow? And a kid, kid says, Yes, I want a marshmallow. Do you want two marshmallows? Yes, I want two marshmallows. So, all right, you can eat this marshmallow, but I'm going to go out of this room for a few minutes. I'll come back a little later. If you wait for me, if you don't eat the marshmallow, I'll come back and give you one more so you can have two. You can eat it now. If you eat it, it's all right. You'll get only one. But if you don't eat, you wait for some time, not determine how much time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I will come back. Then you can eat it. And it's kept in front of the child and the, the psychologist goes out of the room. And unknown to the child, this was video recorded. This was video recorded. And uh, you will see some of those recordings. It's very interesting. And very funny also, very cute. I got it from YouTube. And the interesting thing is, some children, all of them said we will wait for two marshmallows. All of them said we, wa we want two. And some of them did wait. Some of them did not. They said we will wait, but they could not wait. And they saw that sweet in front and you just remember they are four year old. So for four year old kid to wait uh, for ten minutes also is a torture. When will, the, when will sir come back and then I can have two. And some of them succumbed to the temptation and ate the marshmallow. Now what the psychologist did, Walter Michel, what he did is, he divided the two groups on pen and paper, he did not tell the children anything. 14 years later, he went back to those children and he found amazing differences between the two groups. He went and interviewed their parents, their uh, classmates, their teachers and he found those children who were able to control themselves, they said we will wait and they did wait. They, on the average, on the average, they did better in academics, in co-curricular activities, in sports. They were regarded as more confident, self-controlled. And the other group, significantly lower uh, scores in, you know, SAT uh, scores and all that. Now, it's amazing, just a small thing, little bit of self-restraint. I want to do this and I do it. And the other person says, I want to do this, but I can't do it. Okay, so that little thing. Basically, what he is saying is that um, crucial to success in life is the ability to delay gratification. I want something. For that, I have to make the necessary sacrifices. So maybe I have to wait a little bit before I get my reward. It's a very small thing, but this this key insight is very important. And very interestingly, have you heard of the concept of uh, emotional intelligence? Uh, there's a new concept. Not very new actually. There is a psychologist Daniel Goleman. He uh, gave this concept of emotional intelligence. In fact, more popularly the term used is EQ versus IQ. IQ is normally mostly um, analytical, numerical abilities and most of you will have very high IQ here. Why I am bringing up this subject is he said for success in life, both in career, in academics and more so uh, when you go to a job, your career and your family life and your relationships with others, EQ is more important than IQ. That's what he's trying to say. Now, the very interesting point he makes is in his book, Emotional Intelligence. There I found very interestingly he refers to this experiment of Walter Michel. And he makes it one of the core ideas of EQ. Which, which experiment? This thing about the ability to delay gratification, to control the impulse. And he makes it a core point of EQ. He also says, employers, people in uh, different fields, they are looking for people with actually high EQ. And why I am saying this is, um, he made a point, he gave a talk in Google also. And I saw the talk. And he made a point which is very relevant in, uh, in an institute like this. It's an uh, IIT, not any IIT, it's the best IIT pro uh, probably in the country. And you have this so many brilliant young people with extremely high IQs. Now, the point he makes is there is no, no particular correlation between IQ and EQ. There are people with high IQ and high EQ. There are people with extremely high IQs and low EQ. 
there are people with extremely high EQ but not very high IQ. So it's uh, if you plot it as scatter diagram, you will get an evenly distributed plot. Now what he says is uh, that uh, in an institute like this, he is giving a talk to Google. So where you select people based on IQ, you have those entrance examinations and all. So generally people who come into this kind of institute, people have sort of cut off of IQ. You will find people on the higher range in IQ here. So here in this institute, for example, among your classmates, among your uh, teachers, you will find the difference in IQ, the spread in IQ is not much. But the spread in EQ will be quite uh, high because you have not selected for EQ. Therefore, in an environment, in an institute like this or in a job, in a, in a very good place where you are working in research institute or in, uh, um, uh, in a company outside, the difference, the factor which will make a difference to you will be EQ. You follow the logic and he gave, gave this in a talk in Google that I will show you a little bit, the, the relevant portion of that talk. I'm Peter Collaborative on Career Sitley, who said, you know what we found? It, we alone is going to help you. What done is to make, because they are catalytic. If you had a kind of this is Daniel random Goleman. distribution. Now, if you take this pool and you map it on Google or any other company that hires that places a premium on cognitive abilities, this is the like total IIT case sample. Well, what you've done is really interesting because you've, you're skimming the top. Okay, whatever, let's say this is IQ 150, whatever. It's very high. What you have now done is to make a very small difference for IQ. There's very little variation in the population at the very top and a very large difference for emotional intelligence. That means that whatever emotional intelligence contributes to success in an environment like this, it matters more per unit than IQ does. So there's actually a floor effect here for IQ. You wouldn't expect that IQ alone is going to help you be highly effective in this work environment. You got the point. I mean, there's no need to repeat that. Basically, what he has done is, he says, in a general population, the distribution will be like this. There are differences in IQ, less and more. And there are differences in e emotional intelligence, less and more. But when you have a group like this, like this institute, where you have a flow, because you have come through a selection process, you will find what you have done is you have skimmed the top in each, each suppose you have come from different schools and colleges and only the best in your batch, most of you are, of, uh, are the best in your batch because you, you came through a selection process. Therefore, the difference in IQ will, be, will not be much here, it will be about this much. The difference is very little, there is a floor here. But you are not tested for emotional intelligence. So there are people who have got high emotional intelligence, you've got people who have got low emotional intelligence. And therefore, more than a general population, in a population like this, this will be more important than this. In general, emotional intelligence is more important, but here it is even more so uh, in, a, in a population like this. Anyway, it's the same point. It comes back to the same question. I've just shown you the importance of the ability to control oneself. Now the question of Arjuna's question was how do I control myself? Why does this happen? And how do I uh, have this control? Whether it's Duryodhana or it's Arjuna or it are those four year old kids. You know, they can ask the same question. I wanted to wait for sir, but I could not wait. Because the marshmallow was in front of me and I, I wanted to wait. I had made up my mind to wait. I could not wait. Why couldn't I wait? And how can I control myself? These are, these are the questions. Now we go to Sri Krishna's answer and see what he has to say. Chapter 3, two verses I will take up. Basically what he is saying is this. He is saying that um, there are two levels in our activities. One is at the level of our subconscious minds. He calls it Prakriti or Samskaras. So there is a level which is below our, our level of our consciousness and here we have tendencies. We have, it is, you can call it Samskaras or Prakriti. Prakriti simply means nature. 
of an individ individual. What does this consist of? It says it consists of raga dvesha, liking and disliking. Raga and dvesha. Raga means attachments, likings. I want, I want. Dvesha, I dislike. What do I want? What do I dislike? It depends upon you. Your habits. If you are a believer in uh, rebirth theory, so the idea is that we have accumulated a lot of tendencies throughout our lives. If you don't believe in that also, that's perfectly all right. From childhood onwards, we have developed in a particular way. So we have liking for certain food, certain environment, certain activities, books, games, so whatever, certain people. And we have dislikes, certain environment, certain food, certain kind of people. We, we have dislikes. And these differ from people, person, uh, person to person. And these are deep rooted. We are not often aware of this. It's below the level of our conscious awareness. This is one stage. The second stage is when we interact with the world, what happens is we have, we have a reaction. It comes from here and we, we think something, we say something and we do certain things. So these are, these are the level of, these are the conscious level the level of conscious activities already expressed this is this is not expressed sub unconscious this is conscious and expressed at this level it is too late already you know i am dieting i want to control watch my weight i have this delicious pastry in front of me i like it i eat it up and then later i regret it i had thought i would not eat this but i have now eaten it so what happened was, here is a raga, here is a raga and you see this attractive object X in front of you and you think I want it, you order it, give me one and eat it up and then you regret it because you decided not to take this actually. This is what is happening all the time. It happened to Duryodhana, it happened to the little kids and Arjuna is asking why does it happen? It happens because of this. From our samskaras directly, this is expressed. And Sri Krishna says this in third chapter in the shloka number 33. He says, Sadrisham cheshtate swasya prakrite rjyanavanapi prakritim yanti bhutani nigraha kim karishyati. Very interesting shloka. He says, Sadrisham cheshtate swasya prakrite rjyanavanapi. A person who is a jnani who has read the shastras, I want to lead my life in this particular way. I want to meditate, realize God, and I want to um, have daily meditation, exercise, have a fit body, I want to do my studies in this particular way. Everything is there. Jnanavan. He is aware of what he wants to do, he or she. But, Prakriti he says, Sadrisham cheshtate swasya, Prakriti jnanavan api. Prakriti is this one. Sadrisham means according to Prakriti. Even this person who is very alert, he works according to Prakriti. Prakritim yanti bhutani nigraha kim karishyati. Such an interesting uh, comment by Sri Krishna. People act according to their natures. What can self control do? Nigraha kim karishyati. And the immediate doubt which is raised in all the commentaries is if self control is of no use, then um, what is the point of all this meditation and yoga and all spiritual practices? And they raise this doubt. Then what is the point of all this? What he is saying is, we have this prakriti and then it is expressed. At this level it is unconscious, you are not aware of it, you cannot do anything. At this level it is already expressed, you may stop it once, very, very difficult to stop. You may stop it once, next time you will fail. You fail twice, maybe succeed once and you get frustrated. It goes on like this. What is the way out? Sri Krishna says, in the 34th verse he gives the secret. Indriyasya indriyasya arthe raga dvesha vyavasthe tau tayorna vashama agachet tau hi asya paripanthi nau 3.34 The secret is here. He says between these two levels, are we clear about these two levels? One is the uh, subconscious level samskara, this one, prakriti. And the next one is action, karma. He calls this the uncontrollable le uh, level, it is a conscious level. It is conscious but difficult to control. And this is unconscious but um, 
because it's unconscious you can't control it you're not aware of it so this is the, he says this is the third level and this is the first level and says the secret is Sri Krishna gives this is the important point the whole lecture this is the mo most important point he says the secret is between these two levels there is another level there is another level and he says this Raga Dvesha it comes in a conscious level and this is the second level this is controllable what he says is from here the action goes here and from here to third level from the first level unconscious level there is a small conscious gap when you become aware of likes and dislikes coming up boiling up from within before it takes on the form of a strong desire thoughts or you already say something a flash of anger comes and you hurl an insult at somebody later on you are going to regret it for be behaving like that and did not have said that you feel that but you already said it at that level it's very difficult to control you know he says I became so angry I was burning up from the top of my head <laughs> to my toes so that's already at this level third level but he says Krishna says at this level this is sick there's a gap there's a conscious gap a window of opportunity at that level you can control it at that level you can control it you can consciously control it what he's saying is this Raga Dvesha likes and dislikes according to our sense organs Indriyasya Indriyasya Arthe means earlier shloka what it means is each Indriya has its Vishaya Indriya means sense organ so eyes have Chakshu has Vishaya as form these are forms ears Shabda tongue taste Rasa like this the five Indriyas have their Vishaya Indriyasya Indriyasya Arthe Raga Dvesha Vyavasthito each of them have fixed likes and dislikes which are in your subconscious mind there are certain forms I like certain forms I do not like to see uh, certain sounds which I like certain things which I do not like to hear and so on certain things I like to taste certain things I do not like to taste all these are our conditioning and they are expressed in action in karma between these two levels he says there is a third there is a second level at which he says Krishna says what you can do is you can exercise conscious control like a traffic policeman you know you have a chaura here there is a traffic policeman there what he does is he controls traffic now you have a particular aim in life so maybe it might be studies it might be meditation God realization whatever you know very well just like Duryodhana said I know what is right and what is wrong how do you know what is right and wrong according to your aim of life the certain things which are right or certain things which are wrong if a little child wants two marshmallows the right thing is not to eat the marshmallow until sir comes back and the wrong thing to do is to eat it up because you will not get the second marshmallow in the same way that's a very simplistic thing but in the same way it works for all of us what is right and wrong in life we know now this policeman this conscious level what you have to do is whatever is coming from your subconscious it will be in the form of think this say this do this you filter it at this level certain things which are in accordance with your aim of life what you want to do or what you want to be those you allow okay pass and you are expressing as action certain things which are not in accordance with what you want in life those you disallow you divert them and you replace them with something good because you can't have a vacuum you must think something say something and do something so there is a decision which you have to take at this level there is a decision which you have to take it's not all that complicated my diagrams look very complicated at this level you have to take a decision and the thing about the decision is very interesting thing I'll tell you this is a power which we all have actually 24 hours a day in the um, Kata Upanishad says Shreyam and Preya what is good for me and what is pleasant for me Shreya and Preya what is good and what is pleasant Swami used to talk about it often Shreya and Preya Preya pleasant what I like to do now and Shreya what I know is good for me now if they if they are same what I like to do and is good for me is very easy for life is becomes very easy but often unfortunately they are not same 
what I would like to do and what I actually, what is good for me I know, these two are often different. For example, how many of you, if you could, I am not asking you whether you do it or not, but if you could, you would like to wake up at 4 o'clock and meditate and exercise and study or whatever, each day in the morning you would like to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, how many of you would like to do it, if you could do it, how many of you would like to do it? So many? Nine, more than 90% of the audience? If I could do it, I would do it. How many of you like sleeping comfortably at 4 o'clock in the morning, especially in a cold winter morning? How many of you like it? Achha lagta hai. The same 90% of the audience who say that I want to get up early in the morning, it would be very nice if I could do it and I could study and I could exercise, I could uh, do meditation, whatever or take an early morning walk and I the same person also says I like sleeping in the morning. Now what happens is here is what I want to do, here is what I like doing and there is a pull. They are pulling in opposite directions. This is the problem and what Sri Krishna says is here you have to take a decision and decision is suppose A and B. If I ask you to choose, please come. Make a choice in any way, give any, any sign or symbol, what is anyone, correct. So this is what we normally do, what is your name? Ritambar. Ritambar, okay, thank you. Normally that is what we do, we, we decide something, okay, I will choose this one or we do this or something. But decision actually means you choose this and you cut this out. What it means is, this one only, this is no longer an option, why? Because whenever we make a choice, I choose this one. So what is good for me, I choose. The moment I choose what is good for me and I sacrifice which is pleasant for me, it's painful. It's painful to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And if it's painful, what happens is, if this is a still a viable option, the bed is there, warm and cozy, razai hai, you feel like crawling back into bed. Tomorrow onwards, I will follow the routine, not today. That's what happens. And that is because this has not been cut out, it is still available, very much available. That little, that little sweet marshmallow, did you notice one boy was looking like this or one girl was looking all the time? Why? I will not look at it, it is not available to me, it is not in front of me. This is a decision, that is the correct way to do it, I will not look at it. I will not take it, whatever happens I will not take it. So decision, in fact this one comes from Caesar, you know Caesarean operation? Cesare, to cut, it means to cut. Decision means not to select, it means to cut. To cut what you are not going to do. So you remove it from your life. This will not be there any anymore. This will not be there anymore and this is the only one available. There is no question of going to this, this one anymore. And that is how you take a decision. So Sri Krishna says, you take a decision. and you select each time you put the Shreya instead of the prayer. Now what happens when you do this? It is not easy. It takes time and you, at first you won't be able to do it because it is a very small gap between unconscious desires and expressed. Usually it happens after that you regret it. But if you have this knowledge in the background of your mind, you keep thinking about it, very soon you will understand why it is happening in your life. And with this decision making power, if it increases uh, over the time, you begin to control it. And sometimes you will be surprised to see, at that moment you are able to control it. So the traffic policeman is working. Most of you have done it, because you are in such an institute, you have made sacrifices in your study life. Whereas your batchmates did not, you did it. So you can do it, it is possible, it is there. And one more thing I will add to this. It is in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, says uh, Samskara and Vritti, Evam Vritti Samskara Chakram Avartamanam, he says, this is the conscious level, Vritti means thought and Samskara means your conditions, impressions, subconscious mind, this is subconscious mind. And Patanjali Yoga Sutra, there is a commentary by Vyasa, there he makes this point. Our thoughts are coming up constantly. Where are they coming from? 
our subconscious conditionings. Where do these conditionings come from? From our thoughts. What you think that goes back as samskara. What is in samskara that bubbles up as thoughts. Now, by this method, three stages, what you are doing is, samskara you cannot change directly. You are not aware of it. Where is it? What is it? We, don't, we are not aware. But these ones we are aware of. If you consciously keep on replacing these thoughts with positive thoughts, with noble thoughts, with thoughts which are beneficial for you, positive, noble, constructive, slowly these will go back and become samskaras. Over time, you will find good thoughts bubbling up. I read the story of a Buddhist meditation exercise. The Buddhist monk you know, is sitting in meditation and his teacher told him, here is a bowl and here is a heap of black stones, here is a heap of white stones. And every time, you sit for meditation one hour or two hours, and every time a negative thought, anger, jealousy, uh, passion, something comes up in your mind, you take a black stone and put it in that bowl. Every time a good thought, Maitri, Karuna, peace, happiness, it comes in your mind, take a white stone and put it in the bowl. In the first few months, every day you would sit for meditation and it would be mostly after one hour of meditation, the only black thought, the black stones would be there in the bowl, one or two white stones. Over the months, he saw the balance is changing. Because he is practicing this, he is replacing at the level of conscious thought, he is replacing. So, there is a traffic policeman working here and he is replacing, he is cutting off the negative thought and replacing with good thoughts. What happens is over a few months he found more and more white stones he is putting. In one hour meditation he is putting more white stones and lesser black stones and over after a period of one or two years he found uh, mo mostly white stones and no black stones all or very few black stones. Now, this is what happens. The subconscious gets purified. Then the job becomes easier. Then you don't have to struggle so much. The thoughts which come are automatically mostly Shreya, good for your life. I remember one thing which I put here. <laughs> I made a table. I have told the story number of times. The first time I put it in the table. I uh, will tell you the st story first. Then you will make, make sense. I was in Gangotri few years back after taking sannyasa, I thought, you know, Ramakrishna mission monks, we have got schools and colleges and uh, ashrams and hospitals. So, day and night we are working. We do a lot of work. <laughs> Most of the people think, you know, the monks, uh, we have it easy. Maharaj, aram se rehte aap. No, we, we, <laughs> we, have, we do a lot of work, plenty of work. I remember when I first became a monk, a brahmachari, uh, first thing they told me after three days after I joined in Deoghar, I was a newcomer and then the senior monk told me, first I will tell you in Bengali, there are hostel tache, cholista chale achi ke dakho, you have eaten you know, free food for a long time, three days, now time to do some work, here is a hostel with 40 boys, you go and look after them. I thought, if I had, if I had in samsara, I had gotten married, I would have got one or two children, now 40 children, I have to look after 40 children. And it started like that. So I thought, let me be, uh, after taking sannyas, let me wander like a traditional monk, you know, of the old days. I will take bhiksha, I will uh, beg for food, sleep under a tree, whatever, whatever comes, kutia. So I went up uh, to Gangotri, 10,000 feet. The higher you go, more spiritual you are. So, <laughs> uh, now that's what they think. They say, well, uh, stay higher, and it's both tapasvi mahatma. <laughs> One person is to stay beyond Tapovan, Gangotri, uh, Gomuk, Tapovan. That's 14,000, 15,000 feet. I asked him, what was it like? He said, personally, I'll tell you, it was hell. <laughs> there is no chance of uh, spiritual practice because it just to survive it is difficult for some months at, at, a, at an end. Anyhow, I was in Gangotri. I used to live in a li little kutia, uh, wooden cabin. I don't know how many would like to stay there. It was very beautiful scenery, but... No furniture, you have to sleep on the floor. Only thing you have got, razai, this uh, blankets. Three or four on the ground you put it and three or four on top of yourself. No bedding, nothing. No electricity, no table, chair, nothing. And there is only one small window. If you open it, it is like having six air conditioners blowing at you at <laughs> once. So, you have to close that. And if you close that, it is so dark inside. And I used to open my eyes and do this. I couldn't make out whether my eyes were open or closed. I couldn't see anything. And only sometimes you can see the static electricity sparks from the clothes, you know, in, in, in winter, and the static electricity is there from woolen clothes. 
where a monk, I met a sadhu who was living there for many years, one day he was sitting next to me near the Ganga. Those who have gone there must have seen it's very narrow but very fast, torrential, flows very fast. And that was uh, autumn around this time, July, August. And he told me, he was told, they are telling me the difference between the mind of a, of a Vishayi, worldly person and a yogi. What is the difference? If you do this practice for a long period of time, what will be the difference? He says, he told me, I will tell you in Hindi and then translate into English. Mahatma ji, idhar aiye, dekhye, ye Ganga ji ko dekh rahe He says, you look at this Ganga now, in rainy season. What is there? There is lot of water, fast flowing water, very turbulent and dirty because lot of landslides are there and um, soil gets deposited, it is brownish. So he says, this water is, uh, there is lot of water and it flows very fast, it is very dangerous. If you put your foot in it, you will be swept away, you will simply be killed. There is no way of coming out of it anymore. And you cannot drink this water. You cannot give it to anybody to drink, you cannot drink it yourself also. And then he told me, in winter, the same Ganga, this is a, because uh, there is uh, mostly frozen, there is snow up to here, ice. And there is very little water. And the water is, it flows slowly. And it is crystal clear. He said, if there is a bridge, there are two bridges in fact, over that in, Gango, in Gangotri. He said, if you throw up, chawani phek denge, upar se you can see what denomination of the coin it is. So clear, like glass. He told me, there is so much water in a Vishayi worldly person's mind full of many thoughts, good and bad, many, many thoughts, similar, just like so much water is flowing. Second, he says, it is so fast, just as the Ganga is dangerous in this autumn rainy season, a Vishayi person's mind is dangerous. Anytime, anything it can happen. So many times we regret saying certain things, doing certain things. Why? Because our mind said it and it seemed like the right thing to do at that time or we could not resist it and we did it. And it can be very dangerous. In IIT itself, you, once in a while we see in the papers, this boy or girl committed suicide and uh, I read a story, not a story, uh, this a very famous American novelist, William Styron, he's written a book, um, Journey into Darkness. He was a schizophrenic and sometimes suicidal. Because he's a novelist, he could write very well. Memoirs of darkness, memoirs of darkness, uh, memoirs of madness. Sorry, memoirs of madness. William Styron, memoirs of madness. At one time, he was going to commit suicide, and he's written vividly. He said, this is "Absolutely, it felt like I have to commit suicide now. There's no other way." And somehow, he was saved. He was put under medication and all that. Later on, he said, "I didn't understand why I was going to commit suicide at that time. There's no reason at all." This is the mind, so dangerous, it can sweep you into destruction, addiction, spoil relationships, spoil your career, everything, that same mind. And third point, he said, just like the Ganga is polluted now, lot of mud is there, our thoughts are also polluted, so many kinds of thoughts. This water, he said, isko khud nahi pee sakte, kisi ko pila bhi nahi sakte, jo, jo paani abhi ja hai. and he said, our people's minds are like that, they do not get peace. And those around them also don't get peace from them. Opposite, he said, Jade ne kabhi aayenge Mahatma ji, tab Ganga ji ko dekhiega. When you come in winter, I'll show you Ganga then. He says, very little water. Very few thoughts are there in the mind of a yogi. Not that he's mindless. Very few thoughts. We have got lot of unconnected thoughts flowing through us continuously. Distorted. Habitual thoughts. Those are not there in the mind of a yogi. It is safe. Just like the Ganga, he says, you can cross over, it's so little water is there, it's absolutely safe. You can walk across, he says. And in the mi yogi's mind is very safe. It's not harmful to him or to anybody else. And third, he says, Pani mitha hai, khud pee sakte hai, dusro ko bhi pila sakte hai. And he says, the mind of a yogi is like that. It's always at peace, serene. And others who come into contact with that person also get that peace. I have seen some of the senior monks of the Ramakrishna order I have met and outside also other sadhus, good sadhus. Just to be with them, you feel uplifted. You need not go and discuss something spiritual about with them. You simply be with them, exchange a few words, you feel uplifted. Or sit, simply sit near them. There is something in an atmosphere about them which is so much of serenity and calmness is there. 
um, it transforms your mind at least for some time. But that is due to that person, not our own. And there was a very great Swami and one, one Swami who used to stay with that Swami, uh, who is a disciple of Masharada. And uh, this person who told me, he said, I used to stay with that Swami and my mind was at a, such a high plane all the time. And I felt I had achieved something. And that Swami, he was staying in the room, there was some medicine. The spirit is there uh, for, um, you know, swabbing and all, disinfection. So there is a stick with co cotton wrapped around it, which is kept in the spirit. And that Swami took out that stick and he said, look, this has the smell of that disinfectant, the spirit. After some time, if you keep it aside, it will go away, that's, that smell. It does not belong to the stick. Similarly for you. You are with me. Don't think that you have achieved something spiritually. Day I die, after a few months you will find whatever you were earlier, you are that only. You have to earn it yourself. Anyhow, the point is such people can generate, can radiate spirituality. Could be peace up there, dusra ko bhi pila sakte. You get peace, others also get peace. This is the point. Um, I can go on, there is more to it, but we have almost run out of time. I will stop here, I will sum up. I have said only one thing today. And they say that you have heard of the con some concept of take home salary. After all the deductions and all that, they think what you take home, the amount you take home, home, that's called your take home salary. So what is your take home from today's talk? Your take home from today's talk is, it's a central question of anybody's life. I have certain goals in life, I have to go towards it. How do I get the discipline, the control over my life to go towards it? You understand what sweeps you away from that? The samskaras from inside which are expressed in thought, speech and action. These sweep me away. At the level of samskara I cannot control and I am not aware. At the level of action difficult to control, already expressed. Answer, he says, Tayorna vashama agachet. Don't come under the sway of your raga dvesha. They are being expressed in thought, word and action. Before that happens, there is a window of opportunity. Be the traffic policeman there. Even if you cannot do it consciously right now, at least reflect on what happened. As you reflect, that, that conscious window comes in, uh, in control. In fact, meditation is helpful in that. There was a neuroscientist from Nimhans, Bangalore, who showed that actually he mapped the um, reactions of those who meditated for a long time, for several years, and he found the reactions are less from the autonomic nervous system, more from the, con uh, from the conscious centers. That means they decide what they are going to think, they decide what they are going to say, they decide what they are going to do. Most of our cases we are on autopilot, default setting, whatever is there it gets expressed. So that is the point I want to share with you. Whether it is Duryodhana, Arjuna or those little children or us students or Swami Sarva Priyananda or anybody, whatever our aim in life. This is a very interesting and very important thing to understand. This gap, level 2, between level 1 and level 3, there is a level 2 which we must capitalize on. We must gain control over that level. This is the talk for today. Uh, we have almost run out of time, nearly 7. If you have got questions, I will deal with it. Tomorrow and day after, I will go much deeper. No videos, no PowerPoint, because I normally I do not uh, like this because uh, it interferes. You know, the audience is constantly looking there, sometimes at me. So, I will shut that down. I will speak to you directly. Tomorrow's to topic is purposeful life with Vedanta. What is the aim or purpose of human life? What does Vedanta say? Who am I? We deal with that at the deepest level, a very profound uh, question. And I will show you. Um, actual steps, you will travel with me to the level of body, mind and beyond to the Atman. How we can have a deep immediate ex experience, Sakshat what they say. So that we will do tomorrow. And beyond that on Monday, message of the Upanishads, I have selected Keno Upanishad. That is, you know, as students say, engineers, hardcore. So, that is hardcore Vedanta. <laughs> so, that is even more serious. I um, will deal with Keno Upanishad. 
how to spiritualize every moment of life. I say about that topic especially, um, it's a dangerous topic because once you go through that, if you just follow me, as, as, uh, as, uh, if you just follow the scripture, what I will tell, it's irreversible, you can't change it anymore, <laughs> it's already done, <laughs> whether you like it or not, you have stepped irreversibly into another way of thinking, you cannot come back anymore. If that sounds ominous, it's not ominous. Uh, it's uh, actually very interesting and uh, uh, very life-changing actually. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And I'll take, I'll take a few questions. I'll take a few questions. Anybody? Yeah. Just tell your, na tell your name. And, uh, Shutanu, yes. For we control ourselves. Yes. And then, in a small thing, we lose and we feel like we are going back to zero. Yeah. Is there something or what is the way out? Yeah. Question Sutanu asked is very important. We practice something, then we stop. Whatever it is. So, is it last? We feel frustrated after some time. Or is something saved? If you look at this theory, Vritti and Samskara, what you practice consciously, you think certain things, say certain things and do certain things, that is added, it is never lost. Arjuna in the 6th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, he asks this question, Krishna you are telling me to practice meditation, spiritual practices and all, but suppose I do not get jnana in this life, if I do not get spiritual realization in this life, then have I lost both this worldly life and also spiritual life? I did not get that realization, Atma, Jnana, Nirvana, Moksha, whatever, and I did not enjoy life in this world. I, I have given up certain things in this world. Have I lost both? Ubhaya uh, Vibhrashta. From both sides I am lost. And Krishna gives a clear answer. Nahi Kaschid Kalyana Krita Kaschid Durgatim Tata Gachati. Kalyana Krita, person who walks on the path of spirituality, uh, spiritual welfare. He never goes to destruction. So, this is always added up. If you practice something, let it go, fine, it is there. Next time you practice, whatever you practiced earlier comes to your aid. So, you get up at 5 o'clock and hold on to it for at least 21 days. What it does is, it becomes a habit. So, habit has its own inertia. Then it becomes easier to wake up in the, after that uh, at, at 5 o'clock or 5.30 in the morning. If you do for two, three days and abandon it, it becomes equally, it remains equally difficult. It is like, if you want to jump across a ditch, you have to take one big jump. You cannot take few small jumps, because you fall in the ditch if you try to do that. So, you want to make a new habit, you have to push for 21 days, 21 days is just a figure, one month. So, both ways, what you do, it is saved, but it is better to do it for, hold on to it and do it for some time.